My name is Andy Cahan. I'm director of author events, and I'm pleased to welcome two very talented writers this evening. Our first presenter, Stuart O'Nan, was named one of America's best young novelists by Granta for his 1996 de debut, Snow Angels, which was later adapted into a film by David Gordon Green. His acclaimed fiction includes A Prayer for the Dying, Last Night at the Lobster, and Emily Alone. Onan is also the author or editor of four works of nonfiction, maybe most famously for his book on the Red Sox with Stephen King. He's also written a screenplay about Edgar Allan Poe. His new novel, West of Sunset, follows F. Scott Fitzgerald's last year as he struggles to remake his life in Hollywood. Maureen Corrigan, critic for Fresh Air, called West of Sunset gorgeous, compassionate, and an even finer novel about a great writer's determination to keep trying to do his best work, to keep reaching for stars even at a time when he was universally dismissed as a has-been. The book brings to life a cast of famous characters including Ernest Hemingway, Joe Mankiewicz, and round table stalwarts Robert Benchley and Dorothy Parker. From Hollywood in the 30s, we move to present day Australia with Peter Carey's latest book, Amnesia, described by Tim Martin in the Daily Telegraph as an ambitious novel that mixes the story of an Assange-like activist on the run from the US government with stories of political betrayal and bad faith stretching back to the Second World War. Carey has twice the energy of most writers, but comedy, it's clear, is something he takes very seriously indeed. As you must know by now, Peter Carey is the only writer other than Salman Rushdie to have twice won the prestigious Booker Prize. His comic, a bullion, richly rendered novels include Oscar and Lucinda, True History of the Kelly Gang, and Parrot and Olivier in America. Carey has also won three Franklin, uh, Miles Franklin Awards, Australia's highest literary honor. Yes, we're in for a fine night. Please welcome our first presenter, Stuart Onan. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on yet another cold night. I feel like one of those scooters in Star Wars here. It's, it's kind of strange. Uh, I'm going to read from the very first chapter of West of Sunset. So it needs. No introduction, I hope. And I hope some of the characters need no introduction either. So. This is called Chimney Rock. And one of the strangest things, so here's the introduction. One of the very strangest things about Zelda Fitzgerald's hospitalization was that the doctor there, Dr. Carroll, um, advised her to take uh, vacations or furloughs from time to time. So often, Scott would take her out in his car and they would drive around the North Carolina countryside. And even later, when he was in Hollywood, he would fly east and for a week, they would go for a vacation to Virginia Beach or to Charleston or Miami or Cuba. Um, and I really wanted to write about those vacations. So I figured I'd open up the book with one. Chimney Rock. That spring, he holed up in the Smokies in a tired resort hotel by the asylum so he could be closer to her. A bout of pneumonia over Christmas had provoked a flare-up of his TB, and he was still recovering. The mountain air was supposed to help. Days, he rode in his bathrobe, drinking Coca-Cola to keep himself going, holding off on the gin till nightfall, a small point of pride, sipping on the dark veranda as couples strode among the fireflies rising from the golf course. Outside of town, Highland Hospital crowned the ridge line, a spired Gothic palace in the clouds, worthy of a bewitched princess. He couldn't afford it, as he couldn't afford the other private clinics they'd tried, but he pleaded poverty and hashed out a discount with the trustees, begging the money from his agent, an onerous form of credit, borrowing against stories he'd yet to imagine. He had no choice. At Pratt, they left her too much alone. She'd strangled herself with a ripped pillowcase, nearly succeeding, the livid band across her windpipe a reminder. One night while she was strapped to her bed, the Archangel Michael appeared, glowing, and told her the world would end unless she could move the seven nations to repent. 
She took to wearing white and memorizing the Bible. In her paintings, the faceless damned writhed in fire. At Highland, her new doctor believed in diet and exercise, no cigarettes, no sweets. Every day, the patients hiked to prescribed distance, sturdy nurses spurring them on like coaches. She lost weight, her skin tented over her cheekbones, her nose a blade, recalling that awful year in Paris she whittled her body down, trying to remake herself for the ballet. Yet not manic, not frenzied like then, her knees bruised black, feet cracked from practice. After her insulin treatments, she was calm, subdued by sheer lack of energy. Instead of sinners, she painted flowers, big blousy blooms, just as corrupt. She could sleep now, she said, a mercy he envied. Her cursive returned, neat lines running like waves down the page, instead of the bunched, slanted hand he'd come to dread. Let me jump over about a page of really nice exposition. <laughs> really well done exposition. Beautiful assonance. I've always had beautiful assonance. Um, with Zelda, everything was a test. For their anniversary, they were allowed to take a day trip to Chimney Rock. He was to be both husband and chaperone, charged with cataloging her conduct, speech, and intake. Observations he registered automatically, yet resented sharing, as if after so long in captivity, they had a shred of privacy left. It was a balmy Saturday, the dogwoods frilled with pink, the visitor's lot busy with gussied-up loved ones toting picnic baskets. Dr. Carroll himself delivered her to the front desk, handing her over to Scott like a doting father. In her twenties, baby-faced and petite, she'd seemed girlish. She'd been an athlete and a dancer, a notorious flirt, her stamina and fearlessness irresistible. Now, just shy of thirty-seven, she was pinched and haggard, crone-like, her smile ruined by a broken tooth. Some well-meaning soul had fixed her hair for the occasion, gathering the unruly honey-blonde mop back into a knitted black snood which sat cat-like on one shoulder, a style he'd seen on shop girls and waitresses, but one she would never choose, especially since it made her face even sharper, hawkish. The carmine sundress was an old favorite, though it had faded from hard washing. The yoke of her collarbone hollowed, a sheer scarf knotted like a choker to conceal her throat. When he leaned down to greet her, she turned her face into his, her lips grazing his cheek. Thank you, she said, pulling away as if he'd done her a favor. Happy anniversary. Oh, Dodo, happy anniversary. It always surprised him to hear her soft Dixie lilt coming from this wizened stranger, as if hiding somewhere inside his fresh, wild Zelda still existed. The doctor congratulated them. How many years is it? Seventeen, she said, looking to Scott to check her math. Seventeen years, he confirmed, nodding, uncertain if this fact was happy. The number was as illusory as their marriage. As his wife, she'd now been hospitalized as long as not, and in fretful moments, the question of whether she'd been mad all along and he attracted to that madness unsettled him. Enjoy yourselves, the doctor said. We will, she said, and took Scott's hand, squeezing it as they walked through the vaulted lobby and into the bright day, relinquishing it only when he opened the car door and helped her in like a footman. On her seat rested a present he'd bought at the hotel gift shop. Dodo, really, you needn't have. As he closed the door, he palmed the knob, silently locking it. It's nothing, a token. And here I didn't get you anything. She didn't wait, shucking the paper to reveal a shallow candy box. Oh, this is what I think it is. You devil, you know I can't resist peanut brittle. Pecan brittle. It's lovely, darling, but I don't think it's allowed. I promise not to tell. You'll have to help me then, to dispose of the evidence, precisely. How quickly they were conspirators, as if it were their natural state. Together, in another age, they'd been famous for their fashionable trespasses, the stuff of magazine covers and scandal sheets. And perhaps because his fall had been less spectacular and far less punitive, 
At times like these, a nostalgic guilt pricked him, as if, impossible as it was, he should have saved her. Then we have driving, 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 it's driving. Uh, my, my former editor said, I can always tell it's one of your books when it opens with 20 pages of driving. And I was like, hey, I'm American. Stop that. Now they get there. At Chimney Rock, the sun had brought out the throngs. Among the dungareed overall tourists swarming the walkways, they were strangely formal dressed for the theater or the philharmonic. Yet when they cleared the cherry trees and the great stone column rose into the sky above them, piled precariously as children's blocks, they stopped and shielded their eyes like everyone else. The rock stood alone, a chase of staircases stitching the cliff face behind it. High up, at the very top, outlined black against the wispy clouds, a narrow catwalk spanned the final gap. The profusion of tiny people clamoring over the scaffolding reminded him of an ant farm. The idea of joining that mass dismayed him. She was already heading for the stairs. Aren't you hungry? Come on, she taunted. And before he could argue, she was off, cutting through the other gawkers and taking the first flight at a gallop, her snood bouncing behind like a tail. He followed, trying to keep her in sight, but the doctor's regimen had worked. He wasn't entirely well, either. He spent too much time at his desk, smoked too much, drank too much, and by the second turning, he lost her. He knew she wouldn't stop. It was a game. The higher they climbed, already winded, the more he reassured himself she was just being the old, playful Zelda. He was sweating and shed his jacket, stripped off his tie. Once, in Macy's, around Christmas time, Scotty had gotten away from him. Now he felt the same helpless panic. He kept on, using the banister to haul himself up, resting on the landings, peering skyward, hoping to find her laughing at him from the catwalk. His fear, remote yet real, was that when he reached the top, she wouldn't be there. A crowd gathered where she'd climbed the rail and swan-dived. Once across the catwalk, he saw her immediately, her red dress a flag. She stood at the far end of the rock, bellied up to the rail, looking out over the valley with everyone else. When he slid in beside her, she covered his hand. Now that he'd stopped, he was pouring sweat, drops gathered in his eyebrows. You're getting old, Dodo. You always were faster than me. You should really take better care of yourself. I suppose that's partly my fault. I'm supposed to take care of you, aren't I? I'm afraid I've been a grave disappointment in that category. I can take care of myself. Not hardly. We're supposed to take care of each other, he said. I don't want you to have to take care of me. I just want to go home. I know. I've been good, haven't I? You have. I try so hard and things go wrong and I can't stop them. I wish I could. I know you do. You do? She asked, of course, I'm the king of things going wrong, and I'm your queen. You are, he said, because though the throne had sat empty for many years and the castle, like the kingdom, long since fallen, she was. Despite all they'd squandered, he would never dispute they were made for each other. On their way back to the catwalk, they came across a group of school children kneeling over sheets of paper, making charcoal rubbings. The rock was embossed with fossils, skeletal fish, evidence that all of this had once been underwater. They're beautiful, she cooed, a judgment he automatically resisted as sentimental. As she went from child to child like a teacher, praising each, he thought he should be more sympathetic. Wasn't every world ultimately a lost world, every memento a treasure? The descent seemed longer. And then in the racketing cafeteria, they had to wait. The special was goulash with noodles. He made the comment that the food wasn't much better than the hospitals, expecting her to argue. She said nothing, kept chewing vacantly as if she hadn't heard. He leaned over his plate and waved his fork to get her attention. Even then, it took an effort to rouse herself. I'm sorry, darling, she said. I'm just tired. He was so used to watching for signs. He understood. He was tired, too. Back at the car, the sun had moved. 
The pecan brittle had melted into a gluey mess, taking the shape of the box. Well, you can wait till it hardens, he offered, then break it again. I shouldn't be eating it anyway. Once more, it felt like they were escaping, leaving the throngs and the crammed lot behind. They climbed the switchback road up the mountain, stopping at the top to appreciate the view and the rarefied quiet, sharing an illicit cigarette. Far below, in the trough of the valley, Lake Lure sparkled, sunstruck. A few stray clouds draped shadows over the slopes, reminding him of Switzerland. Remember our chalet in Gestad? the one where Scotty split her chin open. He'd been thinking of the antler chandelier and the great sooty fireplace and the eider duvet on their bed, but now he could picture the polished hardwood staircase and Scotty trying to climb it in her Dr. Denton's, the misstep and the solid knock of bone shocking them like an alarm. Strange how the past was both open and closed to them, but she'd remembered. So often she couldn't. I was thinking, he said. What do you think about Scotty coming down for a bit before she goes off to camp? She dipped her head and drew a line in the dust with the tip of her shoe. She doesn't want to see me. Of course she does. I think this is a good opportunity. She might not be able to for a while. You're not making her. She wants to see you. If you think you're up to it, I think you are. I would like to see her. I figured. I wish I could tell you I'll be good for her. I understand, he said, and looked at her to seal the pact. She could be so reasonable. For an instant, he thought of kissing her cheek, but today especially feared she might misinterpret it. They gazed out over the silent vista again, and then, after she'd taken a last drag of the cigarette and dropped it in the dust for him to crush, turned and headed back to the car. As they coasted down the far side, he said, I wonder if groundhogs like pecan brittle. Southern ones do. I can't speak for you Yankees. I believe they prefer peanut brittle. Oh, Dodo, it's been such a nice day. I don't want to go back. I know. Seventeen years, she mused. It doesn't seem that long. No, he said, though he could disagree. At the same time, he could feel the day waning and their moments alone together. Visiting was always hard, but these field trips were a torture, even more so when they went well. In the end, he was charged with returning her to her cloister. There was something of a surrender to it that chafed his honor, as if he should be fighting for her. All the way through the hot, flat town and up the long, winding hill, instead of relief, he felt he was conspiring in his own defeat, a traitor to them both. He checked her in at the front desk. The doctor was busy with other visitors, and a chipper nurse took her from him, asking if they had a nice time. Very nice, Scott said. It's our anniversary, Zelda said. I know, the nurse said. Happy anniversary. Why, thank you. Happy anniversary, Dodo. Happy anniversary, he said, chastely embracing her, then letting go. Poor Dodo, don't look like that. I'll see you next weekend. I'll be good. I promise. I'll talk to Scotty. Do, please. Till then, my love. She blew him a kiss and let the nurse lead her away through the doors toward the women's wing, leaving him alone again. Outside, he maundered to the car, sapped of purpose. Her pecan brittle sat in the back seat, evidence of his meager effort. Later, on the darkened veranda, it would serve as his dinner. Monday, when he met with the doctor, he reported that she'd been fine. They'd gotten along. Her memory was sharp, her speech clear, her thoughts coherent. He didn't mention the cigarette or the pecan brittle or her manic gallop up the stairs or her blank face as she chewed her goulash. The doctor seemed pleased and agreed that seeing Scotty would be good for her. But then, after Scott had successfully lobbied Scotty, Zelda attacked her tennis partner with her racket, breaking the woman's nose, and was moved to the locked ward. Scotty went off to camp as planned, and when Ober called and said Metro wanted him to come to New York for an interview, he took the first train from Asheville. For two full days, he was completely, rackingly sober and passed. Six months at a thousand a week. He wanted to tell Zelda face to face, but she was in isolation. The doctor forbade him from seeing her, an affront and a reprieve. He waited till the last minute, in fact, after he'd packed up and left town, 
composing the letter in the Roosevelt Hotel in New Orleans, across from Union Station. Dearest heart, he wrote, please forgive me. I have to leave for now to pursue our fortunes. I wish there were any other way. Keep working and try to be good, and I will where I am. The next day, on Metro's ticket, he took the Argonaut West. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, I still talk in a strange way, but uh, I've been living in New York City for 25 years. <laughs> and, um, and I was just thinking out there that um, a lot of the most Australian books I've written have really been, have come from, from living in New York and, and, and sharing stories with my New York friends. And I think I would never have written True History of the Kelly Gang if uh, the paintings of Ned Kelly had not been at the Met and I kept on bringing my friends there to, to show them the paintings and tell them the story. So, and this book's a little bit like that too, in that whenever I tell my New York friends that, uh, the CIA took part in overthrowing the Australian government in 1975, you do get a certain response, you know, that there's a certain peaking of interest. Um, and uh, that's what this book's about. Uh, so it's an Australian story, but it's your story too. <laughs> um, sometimes, I, I was recently in Australia, and this is a story, there was a sort of a, newspaper story which didn't have anything to do with the CIA in it, and that was the general, generally accepted story. And the amnesia that I refer to, or one of the forms of amnesia, is this huge thing happens where our dearest friends do this thing to us, and we sort of know that they have, and we pretend it hasn't happened, and then we politely forget it, and so on. And... Um, some people worry whether, whether I, I might have just made it up and uh, this is just a bad dream that I had. And uh, I didn't have to do that in Australia this time. And the wonderful thing about the novel was that this, the story, I was on the Australian Broadcasting Commission, which is like the BBC. And I was permitted to talk about my book on, you know, on something like, you know, 11 radio stations and, and three TV stations and not be contradicted. And... Um, it was such a joy. In New York, I'm talking about this, people do want to contradict me a bit more, but their, their, their source of information is basically Google, so that's a little bit... <laughs> Before I read, let, let, let me just... This is... Uh, Gough Whitlam was the Australian Prime Minister, who so many of us loved and admired, who died recently. And this is, some, this is something that Gough said in 1977, having been ousted in 1975. There is profoundly increasing evidence that foreign espionage and intelligence activities are being practiced in Australia on a wide scale. I believe the evidence is so grave and so alarming in its implications that it demands the fullest explanation. The deception over the CIA and the activities of foreign installations on our soil are an onslaught on Australia's sovereignty. Now, can I make you interested in this? I'm going to try. Um, I'll read from the first two chapters, taking, um, following your example, sir, uh, and still I'm giving an introduction. That's terrible. Um, the first two chapters really, really concern, concern one of the protagonists, uh, who we'll, you'll learn about in a moment. Unfortunately, I won't have time to uh, read you a lot about the, 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 the young woman who is a hacker, and uh, she'll be mentioned here, but she'll be an important character in the book. So all I'm trying to say is the book is not totally about old men. <laughs> it was a spring evening in Washington, D.C., a chilly autumn morning in Melbourne. It was exactly 2200 Greenwich Mean Time when a worm entered the computerised control systems of count countless Australian prisons and released the locks in many other places of incarceration some of which the hacker could not have known existed. 
because Australian prison security was, in the year 2010, mostly designed and sold by American corporations, the worm immediately infected 117 US federal correctional facilities, 1,700 prisons and over 3,000 county jails. Wherever it went, it traveled underground in darkness like a bushfire burning the roots of trees. Reaching its destinations, it announced itself. The corporation is under our control. The angel declares you free. This message and others more elaborate were read in English by warders in Texas, contractors in Afghanistan, Kurdistan, in immigrant detention camps in Australia, in Woomera, black sites in the Kimberley, secret centers of rendition at the American Signals facility near Ellis Springs. Sometimes prisoners escaped, sometimes they were shot and killed, bewildered Afghans and Filipinos, an Indonesian teenager wounded by gunfire, a British Muslim dying of dehydration, all these previously unknown individuals were seen on public television wandering on outback roads. The security monitors in Sydney's Villawood facility read, the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth. My former colleagues in the press asked, what does this language tell us about the perpetrators? Well, I didn't give a toss. I was grateful for a story big enough to push me off the front pages where I had already suffered pants on fire. I was spending my days in the Supreme Court of New South Wales paying Nigel Willis QC $500 an hour so I could be sued for defamation. Nigel's billable hours continued to accrue well past the stage when it became clear that he was a fuckwit and I didn't have a chance in hell. But cheer up, mate. He was betting on a three to two on a successful appeal that my barrister also owned a racehorse was not the point. Meanwhile, there was not much for me to do but read the papers. Feds now say Angel is an Aussie worm. Would the defendant like to tell the court why he's reading a newspaper? I'm a journalist, my lad. It's my trade. Attention was then brought to the state of my tweed jacket. Ha <laughs> my lad. When the court had its joke, we adjourned for lunch. And I, being unaccompanied on that particular day, took my famously shambolic self across to the Botanical Gardens, where I read the Daily Telegraph, Daily t t sorry, I read the Daily Telegraph, down by the Rose Gardens, amongst the horseshit fertilizer. I learned that the terrorist, who had been obviously a male Christian fundamentalist, had now become the daughter of a Melbourne actress. The traitor appeared very pale and much younger than her 30 years. Dick Connolly got the photo credit, but his editor had photoshopped her face, for in real life she would turn out to be a solid little thing whose legs were strong and sturdy, not at all like the waif in the telegraph. She was from Coburg in the north of Melbourne, a flat, forgotten, industrial suburb, coincidentally, coincidentally once the site of Pentridge Prison. She came to her own arraignment in a black hoodie, slouching presumably to hide the fact that our first homegrown terrorist had a beautiful face. Angel was her handle. Gabby was her name in what I have learned is called Meat World. She was charged as Gabrielle Bailleau, and I had known her parents long ago. Her mother was the actress, Celine Bailleau. Her father, Sando Quinn a Labour Member of Parliament. I returned to my own court depressed, not by the outcome of my case, which was preordained, but by the realisation that my life in journalism was being destroyed at a time I might have expected my moment in the sun. I'd published several books, 50 features, thousands of columns, mainly concerned with the traumatic injury done to my country by our American allies in 1975. While my colleagues leapt to the conclusion that the hacker was concerned simply with freeing boat people from Australian custody, I took the same view as our American allies, that this was an attack on the United States. 
it was clear to me straight away that the events of 1975 had been a first act in this tragedy and that the angel worm was a retaliation. If Washington was right, this was the story I had spent my life preparing for. If the events of 1975 seem confusing or enigmatic to you, then that's exactly my point. They're all part of the great amnesia. More to come. In court, I listened as my publisher got a belting from the judge, and I saw his face when he finally understand it, stood he could not even sell my book as remained it. Pulp, he said, including that copy in your hand. Damages were awarded against me for $120,000. Was I insured or not insured? I didn't even know. The crowd outside the court was as happy as a hanging day. Feels, feels, the new, new international, news international guy shouted. Look this way, Felix. That was Kev Dawson, a cautious little prick who made his living rewriting press releases. Look this way, Felix. What do you think about the verdict, Felix? What I thought was our sole remaining left-wing journalist has been pissed on from a mighty height. And what was my crime? Repeating press releases? No, I had reported a rumour. In the world of grown-ups, a rumour is as much a fact as smoke. To omit the smoke is to fail to communicate the threat to the landscape. And in the Supreme Court of New South Wales, this was defamation. What next, Felix? Rob a bank? Shoot myself? Certainly no one would give me the angel story, although I was better equipped, Wired magazine, take note, better equipped to write it than any of the clever children who would be hired to do the job. But I was, as the judge was pleased to point out, no longer employable in your former trade. I had been a leader writer, a columnist, a so-called investigative reporter. I'd inhabited the Canberra Press Gallery where my rumours had a little power. I think Alan Ramsey might have even liked me. For a short period in the mid-70s, I was the host on Drive Time Radio on the ABC. I was an ageing breadwinner with a ridiculous mortgage. I was there, I'd therefore been a screenwriter and a weekend novelist. I'd written both history and political satire, thrillers, investigative crime. The screen adaption of my novel, Barbie and the Deadheads, was workshopped at Robert Redford's Sundance Institute. Institute. But through this, even while bowing and scraping to get seed money from the Australian Film Commission, I remained a socialist and a servant of the truth. I had been sued 98 times before they brought me down with this one, and along the way I exposed the deeds of Kerry Packer and Rupert Murdoch, both old Geelong grammarians, by the way, and that was always a very dangerous occupation for a family man and apparently terrifying for those who rely on him for succor. As the doors of the mainstream media closed to anyone unworldly enough to write the truth, I still published Low Tech Blog, a newsletter printed on acid paper, which was read by the entire Canberra Press Gallery and all of Parliament besides. Don't ask how we paid the electricity bill. I worked as a journalist in a country where the flow of information was controlled by three corporations. Their ability to manipulate the truth made the right to vote largely meaningless. But I was a journalist. I did my best. In low-tech blog, I revealed the Australian press's cowardly reporting of the government lies about the boat people aboard the ill-fated Oolong. I can't comprehend how genuine refugees would throw their children overboard said our Prime Minister, famously. Once again, like 1975, here was a lie of Goebbels-esque immensity. The Fourth Estate made a whole country believe the refugees were animals and swine. Many think so, still. Yet the refugees belonged here. They would have been at home with the best of us. We have a history of courage and endurance, of inventiveness in the face of isolation and mortal threat. At the same time, alas, we have displayed this awful level of cowardice, brown-nosing, criminality, mediocrity, and nest-feathering, my people. 
I was overweight and out of breath, but I was proud to be sued, reviled, scorned, to be called a loser by the rewriters of press releases. I took comfort from it, which was just as well, because there was comfort nowhere else. As would be confirmed in the weeks ahead, none of my old mates were going to rescue me from the slow, soul-destroying grind of unemployment. slowly gummed up there, I began to think about, excuse me. A five-star hotel might seem an unwise venue for a bedraggled outcast to lick his wounds, but the Wentworth was favoured by my old mate, Woody Wodonga Towns. My dearest friends all exhibit a passionate love of talk and drink, but of this often distinguished crowd, it was Woody Towns who had the grit and the guts. He had attended court every day, though he'd had the first to fly 700 kilometres from Melbourne. But any fight I had, he was always by my side. And when I had endured the whacking from the press, I found him where I knew he would be, where he had waited on almost every gruesome afternoon with his meaty body jammed into a small velvet chair in the so-called garden court. The moment he spotted me, he began pouring champagne with his left hand. It was a distinctive pose, the heavy animal leg crossed against his shiny thigh, the right elbow held high to ward off the attentions of an eager waiter. I considered my loyal friend's exposed white calves, his remarkable belt, his thick neck, the high colour in his cheeks, and I thought, not for the first time, that it is Melbourne's talent to produce these extraordinary 18th century figures. In a more contested space, life would compress them. But down south, at the Paris end of Collins Street, there was nothing to stop him expanding to occupy the frame. He was a Gilray engraving. Indulgence, opinion, power. By profession, my mate was a property developer and I presumed he must be sometimes involved in the questionable dealings of his caste. My wife thought him a repulsive creature, but she never gave herself a chance to know him. He was both a rich man and a courageous soldier of the left. He was a reliable patron of unpopular causes, and although he was probably, tone deaf, chairman of the South Bank Opera Company. He financially supported at least two eternal composers who would have otherwise had to teach high school. He had also bankrolled my own ill-fated play. Woody's language could be abusive. Sorry, I'm just, could be abusive. He did occasionally spoil his philanthropy by demanding repayment via small services but he could be relied upon to physically and legally confront injustice. In a time when the Australian Labor Party was becoming filled with white-collar careerists straight from university, Woody was old school. He did not fear the consequences of belief. Fuck them all, he said, and ground the champagne bottle down into the ice. That would pretty much be the content of our conversation and three bottles later, after several rounds of fancy nibbles, he called for the bill, paid for it with a roll of fifties, got me into a taxi and gave me a cab charge voucher to sign at the other end. No surrender, he said, or words to that effect. It was only a short drive across the Anzac Bridge to our house at Roselle and here the best part of my life awaited me. My wife, two daughters, but in the narrow passageway of our slightly damp terrace house, there stood by poisonous chance five cardboard cartons of my book, maliciously delivered that very afternoon. Were these for me to pulp myself? Was this not hilarious that my puce-faced publisher with his big house in Pimble had gone to the trouble and expense of having boxes sent to my humble door? I was laughing so much I barely managed to carry this burden through the house. Apparently my daughters saw me and cared so little for my distress that they went straight up to watch the Kardashians. 
Claire must have been there somewhere, but I didn't see her, not yet. I was much more concerned with enacting the court order. I could never light a barbecue. I have no manual skills at all. It was my athletic Claire who handled the electric drill, not me. So naturally, I overcompensated with the firelighters. Did I really enclose a free firelighter with every book? Was that a joke? How would I know? It was not necessarily self-pitying and pathetic that I set my own books on fire, but it was certainly stupid or at least ill-informed to add a litre of petrol to those feeble frames. I was unprepared for the violent force, the great whoosh that lifted off my eyebrows and caught the lower limbs of our beloved jacaranda. As the flames crawled from the branches to the second floor extension, I should, people never stop telling me, have picked up the garden hose and put it out. Fine. But these dear friends did not see what I saw. I made my judgment. I chose human life, life before real estate. I rushed up the stairs and snatched the audience from the Kardashians. Yes, my babies were teenagers. Yes, they resisted. But there was no time for explanation and I had no cho choice but treat them roughly. Apparently, I smelled like a cross between a pub and a lawnmower. I rushed them out into the narrow street and left them screaming. I don't know what happened then. But somehow, the next door copywriter stole my girls and the Belmain Fire Brigade was soon pushing me aside, dragging their filthy ho hoses down our hall. And Claire, my wife, my comfort, my lover, my friend, was waiting for me. The next bit should probably remain private from our kids, but I don't forget it. Thank you. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for those readings. Uh, the way this part of the event works is you raise your hand and we'll run a mic to you. Anyone like to start us off? Dick, right in the third row there. Thank you. Mr. O'Neill, I wanted to ask you, you're well known as a, a champion of the novelist Richard Yates, who sadly can't advocate for himself anymore. And I wanted to ask you, now that the Library of America has officially embraced him. Oh, have they? And, uh, I you did know, not know. That I guess that means that he's now officially part of the canon. That's great news. What, uh, what else would you like to see happen for him, or I guess more properly for his legacy? Well, I think he's one of those uh, writers who is underread. And the novel that I think is very underread of his is The Easter Parade. I mean, people have focused on Revolutionary Road because the film was made out of it and it was sort of his, his big, big first novel. Uh, but The Easter Parade, which he, he published it in 1976, so it's kind of a mid-career book. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. It's really lovely. Um, it, it's one of the few books, I think, written uh, by a man uh, from a woman's perspective that actually works. So, more Easter Parade. Yeah. Another question? Thank you. Thanks for the good news, too. That's great. Well, I'll jump in while somebody's figuring out their next question. Um, can you talk a bit about whether writing, um, you write in and out of historical events in both of these books, and I wonder if writing in and around historical events is more limiting or liberating than being able to make it up out of whole cloth? Peter? Well, I don't know. Uh, because, you know, but I, the thing that I, in writing True History of the Kelly Gang, which of course no history is true, and no historian would call anything true history, so it's a sign that the book is fiction. Um, 
But it was a very big Australian story and loved and sort of known by everybody. But when I started to really get into it, it seemed to me that I was looking at a stage in which um, it was mostly dark and there were very thin pinpoints of light illuminating certain things. And those certain things would be actions mostly described in police reports or, 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 or by judges or in a court. And because this, these were the stories, very historically, very important to us, but they're poor people. So they left no papers. You know, the, 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 their huts were eaten by white ant or, or, or were burned down. And I therefore respected absolutely everything that one could credibly know. But when my characters walked out of that narrow spotlight out into the darkness, I had a lot of choices and I had some ideas about the character and I, and I followed, I imagined a certain sort of Ned Kelly and a certain sort of story and sometimes people were upset uh, and I always thought, well, you can imagine something else and, and this is in fact an invitation to, to imagine other things because I think this great story has been very lazily imagined by my people. Well, it was, it was also legend, right? Well... He's legendary, I suppose, yes. Yeah, I mean, and Fitzgerald himself is, is legendary as right, well, right. but there's far more documentation on mm. him. I mean, probably too much. Writers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, editors. You know, how, how many posthumous yeah. collections of, of his letters are there? I mean, 20 yeah. Yeah. at least. So I, I was a little inundated with that sort of th thing, but I also looked for those opportunities where I could write into the sort of the, the gaps or the darkness yeah. there. Um, uh, it's also mentioned that Dorothy Parker lived at the Garden of Allah at the same time that Fitzgerald did, but that's all it is. It's a mention. Right. So where are the scenes? Where are those, you know, those wonderful scenes where they get together, where they're right. dancing right. You know, under the stars right. and by the swimming pool? I, that's what I wanted. I wanted to see them on the lot in MGM talking with each other. I mean, on, on the same hallway, you have Dorothy Parker, Aldous Huxley, James M. Kane, and this newcomer, this kid, Scott Fitzgerald. You know, he doesn't know his ass from first base. You know, I want those scenes. I want to get in there and feel it and see yeah. it happening right in front of me. How wonderful. So the history was great, but it can't bring you as close, I think, as fiction what about, can. What about, the, what about the, sin, the sin of inaccuracy in a historical novel? People get very excited about this, and I wonder what you thought of that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you don't, want to, so that you don't want to break the dream. You don't want to break the spell mm -hmm. by, by showing them something that they know is... Yeah not from life, because you're always comparing fiction to life. It can't be helped mm -hmm. there. Even though there's a convention that fiction can do whatever it wants to, it can't. Mm -hmm. I can't make Fitzgerald survive Hollywood. Yeah. You know, I can't go inglorious bastards and have him kill Hitler. It's just, no. it's not gonna happen. So you try not to, you try not to wake the reader from the dream. Yeah. And, and, and the, quite apart from historical novels, finding a way to talk about this, watch it, um, that, you know, this, this novel involves uh, some young kids who are hackers, who, who are, I can't write code, you know, I can't hack my way out of a paper bag. Uh, how was I going to write this story so that somebody who worked at Google, say, uh, would think I knew what I was talking about? How was I, or, 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 or how, how would I do it so that a, an artificial intelligence uh, professor would read it and what would they think about it? Well, I co-opted them, of course. And the guy at Google, read the, who was a science fiction fan, really, he wasn't into the, this sort of writing, but he read this novel three times and in different drafts. And by the end of that, I'd produced something that anybody that knows, particularly the yeah, computers of the late 80s and, and, and 90s and so on, will understand and recognize things. So that's the thing. Of, I want that because I don't want to, I don't want, they're a prime audience really, I don't want to lose them, I don't want them to, to disbelieve me. Yeah, so you go to that first person source that knows it better than you could ever figure it out mm. from say, paper sources mm. or video, yeah. um, and let them help you. Yeah. And then you show them what you've done and they're like, no, 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 yeah, like, yeah. this is completely wrong. Yeah, they say, no uh, way, yeah, yeah. not I, gonna happen, well, no I, way. I, I once read a novel from the, the uh, <laughs> point of view of a, a combat medic in Vietnam. Yeah. And so luckily a lot of Vietnam veterans helped me. I didn't, I didn't even know the chain of command. I knew nothing. Um, and they gave me the voluminous notes because they're tired of people getting it wrong. Yeah. The same thing with, say, the, uh, the families of prisoners. 
They're tired of people getting it wrong. And it always, that thing of knowing what happens in the real world always ends up making the book richer, more interesting. It actually leads to, leads to what you would call a, a more creative process. It lets you make more leaps, yeah. to more things that are sort of absurd because you have this grounding. Yeah. You know? and, and I think that's true not just of, say, what we call realism, but you know, any kind of writing. I mean, oh. it's just fiction. I think if you're going to have little green men walking around, which I occasionally do, uh, you really want to make sure that all the furniture works and the floor's solid and everything's <laughs> right because if you want the little green men uh, to exist, then everything else around them has got to be real, right. I think. Yeah, because so, otherwise the reader's going to start questioning everything. Right. And yet there's, there's always that one thing that slips through that you screw up, you know, and you see it in the finished book and you're like, ah, you know, this, it, it's never perfect. But I what think. about the thing about the history, when people talk about history and, and and I've been occasionally being accused of distorting things or doing this or that, and it was irresponsible and immoral uh, uh, and so on. But you're a, ba you're a bad man. You're just a bad man. Yeah. Well, that's why I try to compensate with this. But, um, <laughs> but you know, like if you say Shakespeare, I mean, Shakespeare was totally irresponsible probably about Richard III. We let him get away with that. That's fine. He made a great work of art. Richard III was a charming chap, apparently, I read recently. But, you know, there's a Richard III society. Somewhere filled with all, filled all 20 of them, I suppose. And they're, and they're all very angry. Yeah, they're yeah. upset. Yeah. They meet regularly to <laughs> vent their spleen. I mean. Oh, nice. Yeah. But, you, but you do try to get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Always. You try to. Yeah. Yeah. That answers that. <laughs> yeah, uh, this, is a, this is a quick one. Do we have another question? Yes. Yeah, gentleman about eight rows back here. Having discussed those dark places that you get to explore and play with because of the jumping off point of this solid history, do you ever find yourself starting out on a project where you're inspired by the Kelly gang or something like that and go, oh, actually, yeah, the story I want to tell doesn't work in this one at all, <laughs> and end up finding yourself trapped by the history that you started from? You mean... Have I ever begun a book and had to abandon it? Abandon it because of the, the historical realities that sort of bound you. Not for any reason. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. I, it's, I, I, I'm, li I'm lying a little because when I, I, I'm at the moment of, in, in the start of another book and in my way to find that other book, I did begin two other books that didn't work. But it, it wasn't really, it wasn't to do with the problems of history. It was just the... The problem, whether the idea had, 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 I think, an idea is sort of like a, a site of exploration. That's where you're going to live, and for the next three years, and it's got to be very rich. And these ideas really weren't like that. They were sort of clever ideas that weren't deep enough, I suppose. But and and you and you run out of material, and all of a sudden you say it's kind of thin. I, I don't see this being two hundred, three hundred pages. I, I wasn't even interested in it anymore. Yeah. You know, yeah, so yeah. Because you probably understood it. Maybe, yeah. Right. It, it's what it's what I don't understand that, that keeps me yeah. going. Yeah. That's that lovely thing of well, it's not lovely when you wake up in the morning and you've got to face it always. But that it, in the end, when the book is finished, the love the lovely thing of having got to the end of the journey and discovered all these things that you didn't know before, and places yeah. that you didn't know, and characters you never yeah. met, who people think are autobiographical or, 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 or from life in some way. And they're just the great thing about them is that you now know these people. And, uh, I like that. Yeah, and, and you, you have—you must have had that totally. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you have to find, you have to discover this yeah. stuff. If you're not making these discoveries, you know, week in and week out, then then the book is going to be just this plodding march. Yeah. You know. Another question. Yeah, on our left. When uh, Robert Stone made his last visit here, he was extremely complimentary of uh, The Great Gatsby, and it seems almost inevitable that it must have sort of cast a shadow over your book. I just wonder what observations you might have about that book. Uh, well, I mean, Gatsby, the first thing that strikes me about Gatsby is how funny it is. It, it's a hilarious, hilarious book. I mean, it, obviously it's a tragedy in the end, but the wryness, the irony, that Fitzgerald gets off in those sentences, the beautiful sentences that sort of double back on themselves, really, really lovely. And people kind of forget about how funny he could be. Um, and I wanted to sort of point that up a little bit in my book there. 
But you're not writing The Great Gatsby either. No, of course so, not. So, so you're not faced with that onerous task. Well, well the, the book that this book will be put up against is going to be The Last Tycoon. Yeah. which is the unfinished novel that Fitzgerald left at the time of his death, which is a really lovely book. It's an under-read yeah, book the way that Easter Parade is under-read. And that's one of the discoveries I made when I was doing the research, just how very good The Last Tycoon is. He really rediscovered his powers when he was out there. Everyone says his time out there was a total waste, but it's a really, really great yes. book. And so I had a lot of fun. If, if The Last Tycoon is the romantic clef about his time in Hollywood, then this book is kind of the re-embodiment of it. This is where he gets the material. So I had a lot of fun going back and forth with that. But I mean, I can't escape the idea that, you know, everybody has their own Ned Kelly, everybody has their own Fitzgerald. Yeah. And so and they're gonna, they're gonna bring that, that character to the book and there's gonna be a little bit of a, a knife fight there. And it's, it's a little scary, you know, you've, you've messed with something that's sacred. Very much I, so, yeah. I, when, when I, I read a book called Jack Mags, which is to do with Magwitch, Mag, Magwitch and Great Expectations. And I was all fine, and I thought it was a slightly cheeky thing for an Australian to do because, you know, Magwitch is our ancestor, and it, he's, he doesn't have to be the dark, dreadful other, you know. And uh, so I, I, I was very excited about doing it and always sort of high on the risk yeah. until I was in a taxi coming in from Heathrow into London, and I went, oh, my God. What have I done? You know, and the, 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 the fear that you will actually not be permitted to get away with the thing that you've done, which is playing with sacred fire. You know, and, uh, yeah, but, but that, that being sort of high on it, that being excited about it, yes. it's, it's, it's going out on that, that, that tightrope yeah. there with no net whatsoever. A little if, terror is essential. Yeah, and, and <laughs> well, I mean, that's the, I mean you, you want to risk. You want to risk big. You want, you know, if you yeah. fall on your face, you fall on your face. You know, if the book's terrible, people will forget about it. They'll remember the good ones. You hope, and you hope yeah. you can write some good ones. Uh, yeah, there's a gentleman all the way in the back in the middle with you. I think, oh, lady, I'm sorry. I'm not wearing my glasses. If we could get a mic to her. Such a quiet, respectful crowd. Uh, it, it seems that way. Is, is it the Eagles, <laughs> really? I, mean, um, I will sound like a man because I have a cold, but... Um, uh, Mr. O'Neill, in Prayer for the Dying, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the experience of writing this book in which you would lose so many people. I'm imagining you, maybe you, well, you, you can tell us about your experience of how much you knew about how many of the characters you would lose. Because, um, I don't know, I imagine that would be a really trying writing period um, to build characters and know that most of them are going to be lost. Yeah, A Prayer for the Dying, which is a very short novel um, written in the second person. There's a diphtheria epidemic in this very small town in you know, 1873, uh, Frontier, Wisconsin. And the main character, Jacob Hansen, is the sheriff, the preacher, and the undertaker all in one. And he tries to help the town through this epidemic and, in fact, the opposite happens, the worst happens. And then there's a forest fire that comes and sweeps across the town, which strangely enough was historical. It's not me just trumping up mm -hmm. events there. Um, but it's a very strange book and, and the body count is very, very high. Um, I think the body count's pretty high in my first five novels <laughs> as well. And this was kind of the culmination of that. Uh, I was inspired by um, Cormac McCarthy, uh, Blood Meridian, which is another book with a huge body count, but, it, but it's operatic in a way. It's very strange. Um, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, of course, um, and finally George Romero, Night of the Living Dead, uh, which, which kind of, you know, these houses that are separated by, you know, miles in the night there, and terrible things happening inside them. Um, so I, I didn't worry too much about it as the writer because I was writing the second person, I, I got very, very close to Jacob. So I was trying to see everything through Jacob's emotions, uh, as well as his eyes and, of course, the, the you voice there. So I, was, I got a little bit too close to the character um, who was going mad. And so I always say the book is sort of not the product of a sane mind because I was a little too far into him. But I felt a lot better after I was done writing the book. Um, I didn't feel bad about the book. Um, there's another book of mine called Songs for the Missing um, in which after I finished the book, I read the book, 
And I was like, wow, that's really sad. That's really terrible. And I kind of felt, I felt really bad for the reader that I was sort of <laughs> inflicting this on them. But A Prayer for the Dying is, it's a gothic horror novel in a way. So if you love that particular genre, it's going to be rewarding. Uh, for regular people that walk in that door, they will be horrified, I think. Um, but I, I think it did its job. Um, and it's very short, uh, which is always a really, really good thing. Uh, and, and especially with the second person. I, don't, I, I can't see pulling off a second person for 400 pages. So. Please. Oh, why well, thank you. Well, I knew, I knew that the prose had to be very, very pretty, and a lot of the, the scenery had to be very, very pretty because terrible, terrible things were going to happen. Awful, awful things. Um, one person said of snow angels, um, after reading it, they came up to me and they said, oh, I'm so glad you didn't kill the dog. And I had already killed the baby. You know, and we're feeling for the dog there. Uh, so in Prayer for the Dying, I knew I was going to kill a lot of dogs, you know, and a lot of cows and a lot of chickens and a lot of cats and just a lot of everybody. So, well, thank you. Thank you. It's a sick book. It's very sick. Well, we can't end on diphtheria and death. So, Peter, maybe continuing the theme just a little bit, and this can be where we end. I've read innumerable books on CIA involvement with um, people who we've overthrown, and I've never come across this before. And I'm wondering why you think there is this collective amnesia, or maybe I'm reading the wrong books, collective amnesia in U.S. culture about this event, and, and maybe in Australian culture oh, as well. It's monstrously public, publicly unimportant to the United States, I suppose. Um, I mean, I, this, the, the, in the, the only time that I, I'm aware of where, where this story came into the public light in the United States is if anybody remembers a 1980s film called The Falcon and the Snowman. Yes. John Schlesinger course. film. And in that, in that film, it's the story of two young men. Uh, but one of whom's working uh, for a CIA contractor uh, in Virginia, I think, and he discovers he, all he has. Th there's there's a U.S. base called Pine Gap in Australia, and this company owned the satellites that were f that were fed by, uh, and, and fed them into this listing station, and these satellites cover, covered uh, you know the eastern hemisphere, so it's sort of you know Vietnam, Laos, China. Uh, the Middle East, uh, and so on. And so this young man, quite an idealistic man, I think he, he, from a, maybe from a military family, so, you know, would think of himself as a patriotic individual, discovered in his work that the CIA were lying to the Australian government, hiding information from the Australian government, and working actively to destabilise this government. They thought Gough Whitlam's uh, government, the person we'd all voted for, and who withdrew troops from Vietnam and stopped conscription and gave uh, uh, equal pay to women and land rights to Aboriginal people and things like that. They thought he was like Ho Chi Minh. Huh. In, in, and uh, he had to be got rid of, particularly because of this base. Anyway, the, so Christopher Boyce in real life is tried. He, 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 he makes a very unfortunate life decision as how he's going to get back at the CIA because he's angry with them as only a young man can be angry. That is, he decides to send, sell, sell secrets to the Russians, which is not, wasn't a smart move yeah. on, on yeah. his part. So how, anyway, so he, he, he's tried and there's a trial. The, the judge would not allow any of this information. Voice is now out of jail and he's talking about mm. these things. But the judge, none of these things were allowed to be presented in court. Boyce went to prison for 20 years, eight of them in solitary confinement. Wait, That's, wait this is our happy ending? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just, it's more fun than burning babies. What can I say? Anyway. <laughs> oh, burning. <laughs> did, you, did you talk with Boyce? No, but I, I read a lot, I've read a lot of Boyce. And I didn't, wasn't right. I mean, I didn't, I don't, I'm only talking about this now. I didn't need that to be convinced, but I'm a long way from Australia now, and as you said, people don't know the story. How could you possibly touch, as an American, touch that story? Well, the film The Falcon and the Snowman gives you a glimpse of that. And then the, the, talking about amnesia, when the film was shown in Sydney, you would think we Australians being very interested in ourselves, like all people are, and, 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 and when it was reviewed, they reviewed the, in the Sydney Morning Herald, they reviewed 
to Falcon and Snowman, and this film contained evidence that our government had been brought down by the CIA. There wasn't a single review that mentioned it. And that's not because they were stopped from doing it. It's because no one knows how to begin to think about dealing with it. Anyway, it, 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 it's, uh, it's all true. It all really happened. Uh, and finally, on this last trip to Australia, as I said, uh, it was a novel that got it into the newspapers and a, and, and a narrative that stopped being... I wasn't shouted down, and I sort of expected I would be, and I wasn't. Amnesia by Peter Carey, West of Sunset, Stuart Onan. Please join me in thanking our Thank authors. You. Thank you.